we are looking at the relationship between religion and religious beliefs and ethics or morality. And I'm following along with the chapter on this topic from Reason and Religious Belief, an introduction to the philosophy of religion by William Hasker, Michael Peterson, Bruce Reichenbach, and David Basinger. Using the fifth edition, this is an excellent text for the philosophy of religion introduction, at least. So they begin by talking about what is ethics. So if you don't have a lot of background in ethics, let's just think about this briefly. Ethics has to do with the study of questions related to the good, to acting rightly, to obligations we have, virtues, values, and then which of these concepts are primary. So we think through all of these things when we do ethics. And descriptive ethics, a couple types of ethics, descriptive ethics really wouldn't be ethics the way that philosophers investigate. These are facts related to ethical issues, including what people actually do, how they behave, as well as what people believe in relation to what they should do. So that would be under the purview of psychology and sociology, for example. Normative ethics is what philosophers are more interested in. This is a study of the various principles of ethics that tell us how we should live, what we ought to do. Those concepts are normative. Normative is telling us what should be the case, what ought to be the case, in contrast to descriptive, which is just telling us what is the case. Now, background here, again, some areas of ethics. We could talk about applied ethics, which is an examination of specific ethical problems and how an ethical system may be applied to those problems. So an introductory course on ethics would likely include some applied ethics. But again, here, we're more concerned with meta-ethics. This is a critical look at the various normative ethical systems, the fundamental concepts of ethics. When you're looking at meta-ethics, that includes a consideration of the origin of ethical principles. Now, we're not talking about a psychological account of how we come to believe ethical principles. We're not doing, talking about how you're raised, what culture you're in, and so on. That's not the concern, but instead the concern is looking into an account of the ultimate grounding of ethical principles, of moral principles. What, is, what are the bases for moral principles? And of course, with philosophy of religion, we are concerned about morality and God, the relationship between God and morality. So many theists claim that ethical principles have their origin in God. And they agree with Sartre, who said that if God did not exist, then that has significant consequences in the realm of ethics. For Sartre, who did believe that God did not exist, he thought that that meant that humans create our own morality by the choices that we make. Now, the theist, of course, would not claim that, but instead talk about how God is related to morality, and there are various approaches that theists take. Some theists claim that ethical principles have always existed in the mind of God, we might say, or maybe even elsewhere, separate from God, and they were not created by God. They didn't originate in God in, in the one sense, at least. God didn't just make them up. Ethical principles on this view are thought to be very similar to logical principles, things that have to be a certain way. Another approach for theists is to take a divine command theory approach. So this is an interesting way of approaching ethics. We'll spend some time on this. The idea is that ethical principles have their origin solely in God. And so that what is right is determined by what is commanded by God, or what is willed 
by God, what God desires us to do. So divine command theorists, uh, three very prominent one include Robert Adams, uh, Norman Kretzmann, William Alston. There are others, of course. The idea then is what is commanded by God is an expression of the will of God. And it's not capricious. It's not just a whim since God is good. Now, there are various criticisms of divine command theories, and we'll look at divine command theories in, a, in another video and look more carefully at the theory itself. But some criticisms include this idea that we have to use an independent standard of judgment to claim that God is good. So if you're going to claim God is good as the source of moral principles, the concern is that we must have in our minds already a standard of judgment to assess whether or not God is good. And so that undermines the claim that ethical principles come about from God. Now, a response, and uh, we could look at Norman Kretzmann's a little bit more closely. We're not going to right now. But one response is that God gives us a sense of what is good. That's, that comes from God. Our sense, inner sense of what is good is originated in God. And that's the standard that we use to judge that God is good. It's already a standard that's within us, but ultimately God is the source of that standard. Now, a concern here is that if truths of ethics originate in God, how would someone come to know these truths? Especially if one is not a theist, that might be a problem. But even if one is a theist, this could be a problem. So theists have different responses to this question. How do we come to know the truths of morality? One response would be written revelation. So, for example, a Christian would appeal to the Bible as scripture, as the source of moral principles. Now, a challenge to this are the apparent inconsistency. So, for example, when the nation of Israel was, was taking the, the land of Canaan, they were commanded to, in some cases, kill everyone, kill the livestock, kill the children, the women, and so on. And that doesn't seem like something that is morally permissible. Now, how do you address this kind of problem? One response is that God has a differing sets of guidelines for different times. So some theists uh, treat scripture in a dispensationalist view where you have certain moral principles for certain times, but then they, as the times change, they don't apply anymore. So that is one response. Now, a problem with taking this response is it seems to undermine our sense of what is right or what is wrong, because if you say that God is morally good in commanding the Israelites to do these certain things, when our inner sense says that that's not right, there seems to be a lot of tension there and difficulties. Another response is that our understanding of what was going on is actually skewed and that we lack the proper perspective to understand what God was doing. Now, certainly there are many theologians and philosophers who have thought through and explained and or attempted to explain uh, what was going on there and how we might have misunderstand it from our approach, but from the perspective of the context that, of the timing and so on, uh, there were reasons for God to do such things. And we are kind of like a child with a parent, not being able to understand always why parents do certain things. We're not always able to understand why God would do certain things, especially at certain times. Well, let's, let's leave that uh, aside for now and consider other ways uh, that how one might come to know the moral principles of God. So another tradition, another approach is the natural law tradition. And this is very prominent in Aquinas, for example. The idea is that God has made human reason 
capable of figuring out what is moral. God has gifted us with a inner sense of, of reason that we can think through carefully and from this have a sense of what is moral and what is not. Now, one limit to this that natural law theorists often add is that our, our ability to reason is somewhat faulty. It's not fully trustworthy due to the fall, due to the effects of sin on that ability. A third approach would be the idea that divine ethical truth is, at least in part, innate. And the idea here is that since all humans are created in the image of God, our sense of right and wrong ultimately comes from him. Now, a, a challenge to this view would be the significant diversity of ethical claims across various cultures. So it seems like it's hard to say it's innate in us when we have such variations. Now, there are a few uh, ways that theists respond to this concern, and they claim that the diversity might arise due to cultural differences, of course, uh, being raised in different contexts at different times uh, would influence what one believes. They also uh, arise, these differences arise due to differing traditions that one may be in within a culture. They might arise due to differing factual assumptions, for example, about personhood. So this is why you might have different views on abortion. For example, if someone believed that a fetus is not a person until a certain stage of development, they might permit abortion prior to that stage. Um, others might believe a, a human is a person at conception, and so uh, say abortion is morally wrong throughout the entire stage of development. So differing views on factual assumptions might lead to differing ideas or claims about what's morally right or wrong in, in particular cases. Also, there might be a, a, the diversity might be due to a variable ranking of the importance of the same moral principle. So for example, um, most people would say telling the truth is really important. Most people would say protecting innocent life is more, mo very important. And, and usually, if you cannot fulfill both of those, a, a person would would lean towards protecting innocent life as being more important than telling the truth, for example. And But you could see sometimes we might weigh some moral principles as more significant than other moral principles, and the weighting or the ranking of those might vary according to a culture or according to different ways that people might be raised. So that all of these things that Thea says might influence uh, our own beliefs, even though we have a natural innate sense of ethics that comes from the fact that we are created in the image of God. Now here, uh, this, let's flip the tables a little bit. There might be a challenge to atheists then. Um, this certainly is the case if you take the view of Sartre, who said that if God doesn't exist, then there is no right or wrong, at least not uh, universal. Um, so how could one have objective ethical principles? Principles that apply to all people at all time, for example, if they're not based in the character of God. So the theist says, look, we have an explanation for objective moral principles. They come from the unchanging character of God who is morally perfect, and that's the basis for objective moral principles. How, what's the basis for objective moral principles from the atheistic perspective? Now, there are multiple responses to this. One option is to take Kai Nielsen's approach to this, and he gives what we might call a Hobbesian rationale as a basis of ethics. Uh, suppose you were raised in a culture without any moral guidelines whatsoever. To use Hobbes's word, this would be a culture that is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's where your life is described as solitary, poor, nasty, 
brutish and short in such a culture, it would not be a good situation whatsoever. Now, a community then that recognized something like, it doesn't have to be the second formulation of the categorical imperative, but something like that uh, as an example of Kant um, and the value of happiness, for example, uh, maybe borrowing from some utilitarian insight. So uh, such a community would recognize it's, it's good to treat people as ends in themselves, to show respect to people and to promote happiness for other people. Um, and we ought to do that. That would be a better community. And so therefore it would be rational for you to recognize something like the second formulation of the categorical imperative and to work to build a community based on that and so this gives you a motivation to recognize such foundational moral principles, and then your life would not be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, we'll close this part one here, and in, the, in part two, we're going to consider a little bit more about meta-ethics and various approaches to ethics and some concerns about how theists have left out some ideas because of a lack of feminist ethics. So that's in part two.